My project last week canceled after I'd already traveled a little bit more than halfway. It's an 18 hour drive. I made it 10 hours, got all the way to New Mexico when I got the phone call that our guest was no longer available. And uh, instead of a reschedule, because it was time sensitive, it was just a kill. And I ended up billing for my travel time there and back plus uh, mileage to cover my expenses. There was no hotel, I ended up sleeping in the van as you've seen in my other vlogs, and I didn't bill for meals. I just had some garbage fast food. It was such short notice. Normally on those things, I like to go to the grocery store, pack, and try to prepare as many of my own meals to eat healthy on those road trips. And I did have the option to fly, but a uh, little backstory on how that played out. Originally, I was on hold to cover that assignment, and it was going to be in Texas, uh, a few hours away from me with a hotel stay. And then the location kept shifting further towards the West Coast. And at that point, production asked me, they're like, we can either release you or and hire someone that's a little more cost effective to hire someone out of San Diego or Phoenix to cover this instead. They have less travel. Or if you're willing to stay on, we'll, you know, we'll help comp you for the added tra travel time. So I weighed flying, but it's going to be single camera outside. I needed six hours of continuous power. That's a lot of batteries. Uh, purchase an easy up tent at like a Walmart and then give it away. I won't have to fly with that, but uh, camera package, lighting, a cart, live view, a whole lot of carry on gold mount bricks. And what was, Oh, and then the big thing was a 15 inch through the lens daylight viewable teleprompter for an eye direct format. And once that prompter got added, I'm like, it's just it's so many media bags. I think I figured out I was going to have about 14 cases, maybe 12, but it would have taken me three plus hours to switch over to airline. And my calendar was open and I prefer to drive over fly. Anyway, I can bring a lot of extra kit and support gear and travel on my own schedule. So I made the decision to drive and they covered me for my drive there and back. And like I said, I could potentially have dinged for part of the shoot day, but based on the backstory of it was Texas based, and then they offered to keep me on when the location changed. I was more than happy to just get my time to that point covered. And I think I passed on a one day shoot. So two days of travel, plus there's a little bit of profit in the 67 cents a mile driving my van that gets uh, 19, 20 miles per gallon average highway. So long short of it is I was whole and um, the missed work equaled about what I build. Moving on to this week, also a cancellation. I was scheduled to cover four days uh, shooting feature packages at a rodeo. It was North Carolina. And uh, obviously uh, with all the hurricane destruction there, the venue is severely damaged. And even if it wasn't, I, just the resources are not there at the moment. So that's a cancel. I've been watching on X, all the posting of the recovery and charity efforts and support and people with private helicopters flying people out of their homes, being stranded and, um, yeah, I'm grateful I just got to uh, sit here at home with air conditioning. Financial hits, fine, I can absorb that. Um, the airline ticket was a credit. I couldn't get my money back. It was about $700, but I can apply that on an upcoming travel project in the next couple months. The hotel was non-refundable, so I'm going to bill production for, it was like, I think $350 for the nights. This week in North Carolina, I was planning to shoot everything on the Burano. It was going to be a lot of handheld. I was really looking forward to the Ibis to make me look more stable than I actually am. But with that job canceled, now's a good opportunity to strip the camera of all its accessories and ship it back to Sony service in Los Angeles to troubleshoot and repair the broken HDMI port on the camera. Don't know what this is gonna cost me. Maybe hopefully it'll warranty it or maybe we meet in the middle or maybe it's gonna cost me the price of buying another FX6. I really don't know. And while we're on the topic of the Burano, I have not experienced so much internet controversy and discussion regarding a professional camera. Uh, I got to go all the way back to, I think it was 2007, maybe early 2008 with the Red One. I got to clock a lot of time and shoot a lot of projects on camera number 99 of the first hundred that were shipped. And it was not a stable workflow. Did amazing things for the time. Just having a proper PL mount camera in Super 35 that was digital, had excellent dynamic range and all the benefits of that big sensor uh, was truly remarkable. Now it took a while to get the colors figured out, but uh, I'm happy I got in ground level and got all that experience early on in the red game. So with that said, um, kind of a reoccurring 
discussion we have here on the vlog, William commented, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, but I don't know everything and I know you have your use cases, but from my perspective, watching your videos, your FX9 still feels like it would be better for your outside of 8K deliverables. Burano seems like a Sony cash grab for a market that the FX9 already serves and serves well from your experience and that you already have a fantastic workflow for. So, uh, yes, I see your perspective. Uh, and here was kind of my reply and you can see some of this history in my vlogs going back like about the past eight months. But, uh, here was my, my response. There's a blind spot in this vlog. There is higher level work. I cannot showcase. I needed a camera to replace the Amira for specific clients. In 2014, the Amira was a $60,000 camera body. The Brano is less than half the cost. I have a few specific clients that demand that level and will cover the purchase costs in about a year. And I get to use a better camera on other projects and the benefits of IBIS with variable ND, clear image zoom, autofocus and slow and quick, LUTs outputs in all record resolutions make it a valuable camera on some FX9 level projects. So raw revenue, the thing is paid for and I didn't use any debt to acquire it. It was a cash purchase. I would like to buy a second one. I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't immediately put the two FX9s up for sale as soon as I received Burano 1 and then use the proceeds from the sale of a mirror number two plus two FX9s. Selling those three cameras would have covered the cost of a second Burano. Then I'd have two matched bodies that should carry me forward for the next several years on my high-end clients, my mid-range, and I can bring it out on the occasional like corporate event gig that's really a, a mirrorless body level job. But if it makes my day easier, and at that level of project, the clients aren't asking for a specific camera anyway. If I own it and it's paid for it and it makes my life easier, I might actually use it and bring it out as I've done historically. The more expensive cameras have a much longer shelf life. So I would rather spend more money to get a longer run with the same camera body because my skill set and stress level is lower when I get to use the same tool for many years versus being, which I've also experienced in the like every 12 months, I got to buy the new affordable camera body and I'm looking forward to picking up a second one. Moving on, I'm going to try to be quick on this one. And uh, if there's interest in me, I'll go into greater detail in a future video. You can let me know the, the feedback in the comments. But uh, the question is, can you do a video on your best business practices in running a profitable video business? I think you have a really nice system. So thank you. It, it, uh, it took me years to get here. I wish I was in owner operator DP with my own equipment. I wish I could have been here in my early twenties, but, uh, it, it didn't happen. I didn't own a high end professional camera package until I think my like, like late thirties, even though I was working as a DP and a director DP from like age 20 on forward, uh, the gear was just unattainable. You know, you're spending over a hundred thousand dollars to get something that would be broadcast or commercial level. When now, obviously, like I have stuff that airs on national television that I, I shoot on my iPhone, so the dynamics are much different now. But as a an example, now I figured out several years ago I need to come up with a minimum day rate to pencil and accept a day in the calendar, and it's more than a labor only rate. So couple times a month, I'll get offers to go work as a cam op or a DP using the production or the network's equipment. And occasionally I'll accept, but for the most part, the like labor only rates are just, uh, they're lower obviously than me going out as a DP with my own camera kit. And I've found like, I need to work three to four days labor only to match what I can clear on a typical day, rolling my van and working as a owner op on a package rate. And historically I always land at least a day a week working as a DP. So it's just too high risk. I've accepted the op days, even if it's one day operating, that'll be the only Wednesday that week. That'll be the same. I accept it. And then I get an offer to go DP on that Wednesday. And I, I I'm not going to burn the person I booked with operator only to go take the, the higher pay DP gig. So through all that, I learned, I got to have a minimum rate that's equal to me gear plus labor. What, what works out to be my, my average billable and anything below that uh, with rare exception, it's just a bad business decision for me at this stage. Now it was not always that way. I, for many years, as I was trying to build up my client base as a DP, I was also working as a gaffer and an electrician on bigger productions. I worked on several feature films, 
a couple TV shows. I partnered up with a, another DP and a gaffer that owned two generators, trailer mounted studio plants of 500 amp and a 1600 amp. And then they had about a quarter of a million dollars in copper distribution, distro boxes, banded cable, 100 amp whips, 60 amp whips, 240 volt whips. And my son, when he was little, he used to help me do drop off and pick up uh, distro stuff. But I managed as like a little side gig. I bought an F-350 pickup truck and I did all of that in addition to all my time DPing. And then I would pick up work, working as an electrician. This is over 10, 10, 15 years ago, but rates would be like 450, 550, 650 a day for 10 hours. Uh, everything I did was non-union, although I did do some Jenny drops on union shows where I was just like basically the vendor. So I could uh, be non-union because I'm basically getting comp through the company, the rental operation, not the production. But I got busy enough as a DP that just like I described in present day, it wasn't worthwhile for me to go work electric or go do a distro pick up and drop because of the risk that that booking would conflict with a, a single day of DP work. And really I only need like one, maybe two days a week on average for my year to have a profitable business. All right. I hope that's helpful. Let's continue that discussion in the comments below. Thanks for watching.